Good evening, everyone. I'm Bill McKeever on the Speakers Committee of the Princeton Club of New York, and welcome this evening to a talk about Greeks and the sea. And our speaker this evening is Diane Harris Klein. And that name may be familiar with you because a few weeks ago, her husband, Eric Klein, spoke to us about the end of the Bronze Age. So tonight we have the distaff side of the family, and uh, I think we've saved the best for last. She's a remarkable speaker and, of course, uh, an expert on ancient history. She holds a BA degree from Stanford uh, in, in the classics and got her PhD in Princeton in the program of classical archaeology. So, uh, of course, we're delighted uh, being part of the Princeton family that she's talking to us at the club here in New York. Uh, she's written a couple of books. She's lived in Greece. She had two Fulbright fellowships that allowed her to stay there for several years. Uh, the most recent book is The Greeks, an illustrated history published by National Geographic, came out in 2016. And for those of you that like that sort of thing, uh, uh, we encourage you to go to your local bookstore. Uh, again, it's called The Greeks, an illustrated history. Uh, tonight, she's going to talk about her current research, which is about the social networks, uh, which ideas flow through ancient Greece. And of course, they exchanged ideas as well as goods and paved the way for our modern world. So she's going to talk tonight, uh, the Greeks in the sea. Uh, Diane, welcome. We're delighted to have you and looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Bill, uh, for this warm introduction. Again, I am just delighted to be here with fellow Princetonians. It's kind of rare for me. I'm very happy about it. Uh, my uh, my um, PhD was earned 30 years ago, and I don't get an opportunity to return uh, very often. So thank you for hosting me, and I really uh, I'm enjoying being in your company. So uh, before I begin, let me just um, make a, a, a note that my historic photographs come from the collection of the archives of the Banaki Museum in Athens. I take as my launch ramp for this paper a quote from the poet Odysseus Elites, who said, if you deconstruct Greece, in the end, you will be left with an olive tree, a vineyard, and a boat, which means with these items, you can rebuild Greece. All three, the olive tree and the grapevine and the boat, need human energy and attention to maximize their being in the world. I hope to show that the making and consumption of olive oil and wine and the making and use of boats embedded in daily life created a field of experiences that both stabilized ancient Greek society and allowed for fractal replication throughout the Mediterranean in colonial migrations. I hope to convince you that the Greeks maintained their culture centered on the technologies and material objects and traditions and experiences through wine and olive oil and being on the water. I will show that things like olives, grapes, and boats were linked to each other through human behaviors and activities, entangled with codes for behavior and flows of information inside multiple networks inside a complex adaptive system. In the creation myths of the ancient Greeks, three gods drew straws. Zeus won the longest one and became the king of the sky as well as the ruler of mortals and gods. Poseidon became the ruler of the seas. And Hades, who drew the shortest straw, became the ruler of the underworld. No Greeks could rule the seas. Only Poseidon could do that. Dominion over the sky and the land it covers, the seas and the unseen world six feet below, belong to the immortal ones. 
but human life consists of the tension between sea and land, between feeling tethered or adrift, being on earth or water, staying home or venturing out, always calculating risks and rewards. In my research, I use networks to think about the social, religious, economic, technological, and material ties lubricated by salt water, olive oil, and wine, which connected farmers, workmen, merchants, seafarers, traders, and consumers, human beings, with olive trees, grapevines, and the boats which carried them to far off ports and customers in the classical period. To read the images, we must apply relational thinking, studying the connections between things, rather than the usual focus on the thing itself. In this network model, there are three types of actors, humans and human actions, such as mariners or making libations, non-human entities, which include animals or inanimate things, such as donkeys and ships, and places like harbors and cities. These human-to-human, -human, thing thing-to-thing, and human-to-thing dependencies take place in physical spaces, including in ports and marketplaces, on docks and roads and at sea. And the fourth dimension here are called fields, body healing, religious, the social, technology, transportation, the sea, which I have layered on top of the three kinds of actors. And this I am calling a field map. This is something I have invented and I'll show you some examples of it tonight. In the period between 730 BC to about 600 BC, the Greeks began to leave mainland Greece and create colonies, fractals of their home cities or their metropolis, mother city, metropolis. These were autonomous from the start, having to create their own trade networks and treaties with local communities. And many of these developed to be larger and wealthier than their mother city. They settled everywhere you see in red, Spain, France, Italy, Croatia and Albania, Libya, Cyprus, Anatolia, and then going up through the ancient Hellespont, modern Dardanelles, up to Byzantium, modern Istanbul, you reach the Black Sea region where they settled in Romania, Bulgaria, the Crimean Peninsula of the Ukraine, and the coast of Georgia. It was called the Pontic or Euxine Sea. Why did they do this? With few exceptions, the homeland of Greece in the Aegean Sea had to rely on trade for many basic natural resources, including metals. Lacking copper or tin, all bronze had to be imported, for example. After the long dark ages, following the collapse of the Mycenaean civilizations in the early 12th century BC, the growing populations developed city-states, the polis. The search for raw materials inspired and initiated Greek exploration of the Mediterranean and Black Sea regions, and they took to their boats. As soon as the Greeks began to depict humans on their pottery, in this case, a late geometric cup, we see men on ships. From the mid eighth century BC, adventurous young seafarers risked everything to establish footholds around the Mediterranean and Black Seas. Optimistic fellows such as these 2,500 years ago hoped to settle or take land and build a utopia where all settlers were given equal shares of the new land and equally bore the risks and rewards of colonization. Young men left their horio, 
their mother city, their metropolis, and with such courage created greater Greece. Many of the colonists may have been inspired by the epic poem, The Odyssey of Homer. Here we see an episode where Odysseus wants to hear the siren's song, which legend says makes men want to stay there forever, lose their momentum, and never get a homecoming, a nostos, as it's called in Greek. So Odysseus asks his men to lash him to the mast and keep rowing while their ears are stopped up with wax. And no matter what he said, keep rowing. This episode shows the tension between wanting to experience everything life has to offer and not letting anything deter you from your course to persist and resist temptations which distract and tempt us and prevent us from reaching our goals. Keep the shape of this boat in mind for later. Let's visit one of their settlements, ancient Massalia, today's Marseille. Herodotus in his histories, book one, 163, tells us that around 700 BC, Phocaea in Asia Minor sent a colony to Marseille. Quote, the people of this city, Phocaea, were the first Greeks to make distant sea voyages. They discovered the Adriatic Sea, Tyrrhenia, Iberia, and Tartessus. Over time, there were well over a thousand Greek city-states, mostly located on the coastlines along the Mediterranean and Black Sea coasts and islands. The colony in Massalia established the first Greek port in the Western Mediterranean, bringing Greek culture, including architecture, to France and Spain with a theater, an agora or marketplace and temples. Herodotus says that a word of mouth process brought more of their countrymen to Gaul. And in our terms, we would call this kind of communication social media. That is, communications conveyed between people who send the packets of information along its way via relationships in networks. Talking about circa 700 BC, he wrote that, quote, the Phocaeans, compelled by the smallness and infertility of their territory, had applied themselves more to the sea than to the culture of the ground venturing accordingly to visit the remotest shores of the ocean, they came into the Gulf of Gaul and to the mouth of the river Rhone and charmed with the pleasantness of the country and relating on their return home what they had seen, they tempted others to go to the same parts." End quote. One legacy of the ancient Greeks is they brought the technology to cultivate grapevines in France, for which we are all most grateful. Every Greek polis shared a common culture. The Greeks called themselves Hellenes wherever they lived. Who are the ancient Greeks? Greek culture includes architecture, sport, drama, polytheism, love of stories and the arts. Their values include philoxenia or hospitality, autonomy, an openness to new ideas, to new people, to trade. They also have an inherent resistance to tyranny, valuing free speech. They are known more for their cleverness and their intelligence and inventiveness than for their brute strength. Greek cities were never united into one country until conquered by Alexander the Great, in part because there were these geographical boundaries and each city protected its territory so that we use the hyphenate city-state to translate their, world, their word polis. Our word politics, their politika, are the things having to do with the polis. Each 
one of them could be democratic, oligarchic, monarchic, or a combination, always self-governing and independent. Networks developed of boats and ships carrying merchandise, people, and ideas to all these places. While some Greeks were seasonal itinerant traders, others migrated abroad and settled there, but with variables of different geography, microclimates, and neighbors. Yet though the demand for oil and wine they were shared, they had common needs and developed the infrastructure for efficiently obtaining these commodities collectively. What we might observe is how unstructured this activity was. From city-states down to individuals, the actors were making their own decisions inside a largely autonomous self-organizing system. Localities participated in building the infrastructure ordinarily without external pressure or being ordered to do so or paid to do so. People took out their boats and ships when they wanted to. There was no oversight for developing the Mediterranean or Black Sea as an economic, social, or technological superhighway to support and maintain the Greek lifestyle. I would note that this is a dynamic system affected by amounts of surplus, shifting partnerships, changes in quantities of the goods, changing prices and negotiations, shifting alliances, and so on. Travel on land required that people bring their own supplies, camping on mountain passes, carrying food and supplies, looking for water, trying to avoid robbers and animals en route. Traveling long distances by land meant one had to lay in enough food and supplies to be self-sufficient for a month. Traveling by boat or ship wasn't without danger either. Passengers had to make personal arrangements with merchant ships or fishing boats to get from one port to another. There were no passenger ships. Like a bus system, the merchants might stop at specific destinations on a predictable timetable where passengers could board or disembark in order to pick up the next leg with a different ship. Because the Greeks depended on the kindness of strangers when they traveled, hitching rides from merchant ships, eating and drinking in ports, trading goods, taking baths, and drinking wine at night, they shared an ethic of providing welcome to strangers. A stranger is a xenos, but it also means a guest or a foreigner. Philoxenia, like Philadelphia, love of one's brother, philo, love, xenia of strangers, is formally a guest friendship. Any stranger that rang the bell could be a god in disguise there to test the mortal homeowner's hospitality. This widespread, strong cultural norm of treating the stranger as a new friend was the only way that all of this travel could be sustained. Sea voyages were vital to the spread of Greek inventions and goods but the sea also facilitated the transmission of their ideas, their writings, political systems, technologies, religious practices, philosophy of education, and the Greek way of life. But all of this transmission really happened when the merchants and mariners disembarked, opening up to Xenoi and swapping stories as they drank wine together and forged relationships. Many social networks grew from craftsmen, lenders, insurers, ship owners, captains, mariners, and the merchants and buyers waiting for their goods in other ports. The Mediterranean and Black Seas brought these people into parallel play for centuries. Communities around the sea worked in their own ways to maintain their ports and invite ships by offering hospitality, repairs and restocking, and customers driven by social needs entangled with personal desires, 
providing hospitality or other enticements to seafarers. The shipping container for all of antiquity was called the amphora, a double-handled jar used for transportation. The shapes of these tell us they came specifically from Massalia, dating to the classical period, the fifth century BC. It used to be thought that an amphora held olive oil or wine exclusively. Only recently, with scientific tests like residue analysis, has it been proven that these jars carried a whole lot of other things, fish, nuts, vegetables, and herbs, and in the case of one shipwreck, an amphora contained beef ribs here we are looking at a distribution map of amphoras originating in Massalia, Marseille, distributed by ships at sea, then up rivers, and then by carts on land. The dots show where jars from ancient Massalia were discovered, both underwater and in land excavations. Each amphora has a story an object biography, an itinerary. Many human technological and cultural practices evolved to keep commodities available in their communities. But as demand grew for these things, a kind of entrapment was the result. Now entrapment comes about when humans feel trapped in a loop by things compelled by demand to do something and they cannot stop. For example, the more wine a city-state produced, the more potters, clay, wagons, and kilns were required to bottle it and transport their amphoras and carry it to the ships. The act of making wine requires containers, forcing humans to continually make these things. A positive effect of entra entrapment is the fact that the Greek craftsmen transfer their traditional and embodied knowledge to apprentices this way through the generations. I mapped the object itinerary or the journey or the possible journeys of one such amphora here. Starting at the top, working our way down, how many humans touched and interacted with this one jar after the potter we see in the middle provided the amphora. While the olives are being harvested and processed for the oil as we see in the top, in the middle we have the potters providing the amphoras for the next stage, filling them up. The oil could be sold locally and stay in the community the oil could be shipped abroad for profit. And finally, when the jar is empty, see the lower right here, it can be recycled and reused, sometimes in creative ways, and eventually ends up underground or underwater, where archaeologists discover them on shipwrecks all these 2,400 years ago. Material things can also acquire new meanings over time an amphora of olive oil on board the ship served perhaps as ballast and was viewed by the crew as a way to make some money. The amphora at the moment of being sold gets a new chapter in its object biography and a new location in its itinerary. The same amphora on land becomes a customer's fuel for lamps and cooking or a point of pride for ostentatious displays to guess when they learn from how far away it came or how much they paid. Once emptied, it becomes a water jug, a storage container, a child's casket, or is put out with the garbage. When the olive oil was gone, the pot lived on in various settings until it was finally broken or buried. For some, the recovery in archeological excavations gave these pots a second life in museum storerooms or display cases. Let's take a closer look now at the entanglement of olive oil with Greek life. In 
all Greek cities, olive oil production tended to involve an entire community behaving in a self-organizing system on a seasonal basis. Networks of ancillary businesses provided services for those involved in the olive oil production. It might involve making baskets or pots or providing wood for carts or caring for pack animals. Once picked, the olives change day by day in the acidity of the olive oil that will come from them. Producers could not wait too long for the pots to arrive at the mill. The ancient Greeks self-organized to keep oil flowing in their communities. The complex adaptive system was constantly learning and adjusting through feedback loops. Using oil in every facet of life made the Greeks dependent on traditional practices required for the agricultural growth, harvesting, processing, trading, and social usage of the olives and grapes. Conversely, life without access to olive oil was not a Greek life. And the ships which brought these commodities to cities which could not make enough for their own consumption were vital to maintaining the Greek lifestyle. Just for olive oil, we saw how dependent the ancient Greeks were on the stuff, used in manufacturing, medicine, providing light for lamps, sunscreen, religious rituals, perfume, plus manufacturing and transporting olive oil. And that was a driver for developing infrastructure such as harbors and ports, good roads, and maintaining trade relationships among 1,000 plus Greek city-states. And so olive oil helps keep the peace. Dependencies connected raw materials to processing activities, making and filling containers, transporting over roads and by sea, selling in marketplaces, using things in public and private spaces, ultimately creating a flexible and layered network across land and sea. Now I have added wine in red at the top to the chart for olive oil at the bottom. We see how olive oil and wine are inextricably connected to Greek culture and were drivers for a kind of perpetuum mobile of trade and travel, mainly by sea, linking Greek cities into a network. Nothing on the network diagram is more social than this concept of philoxenia or hospitality, nor more representative of Greek culture. Receiving hospitality in each harbor was imperative, yet it would be difficult for the mariners to clean themselves up as they approached a port to give a favorable enough first impression to win them customers for the merchandise and hospitality for the crew for the night. Sailing was a filthy and malodorous business. When the mariners reached shore and were able to find shelter on land, they must have experienced strong feelings of gratitude and deep relief, such as when Odysseus accepts Nausicaa's hospitality in book six of Homer's Odyssey. The social value of believing the stranger might be a god in disguise and knowing that gods could appear before you as a beggar helped these seafarers get a meal, a bath, and a bed for the night. To varying degrees, the community on shore might evaluate and size up the mariners on board a newly arrived ship by a relative scale from strange to familiar based on their behavior, language, dress, and hygiene. Each encounter was different beginning perhaps with skepticism, mistrust, and guarded action, and then moving towards civility and even hospitality through the nature of the first minutes or hours of social encounters. If we think of the people and things as they were at sea an hour before they dock, and compare it to an hour after they disembarked and were walking about on shore, we see the social networks and the assemblages of artifacts on land and at sea are not the same. 
the ship's very arrival disturbs the port city, but in a good way. When it departs, the cargo on board will be different, having left some things behind in port and taking on new goods and perhaps a few passengers. Just as Heraclitus said, everything is always in flux. One can never step in the same river twice. One can return to a familiar town and find it changed. The humans expand their social networks through the relationships they make with the new people they meet, the meals they share, the hospitality they experience, the memories they make by being together, and the physical things they socially share, loan, sell, and make. Their minds might be expanded through new stories or images. Information the sailors are given or news they overhear might make them alter their original itinerary. So too, the mariners return to the ship personally changed, richer, poorer, wiser, cleaner, with new friends or customers and fresh supplies in their carry-on bags. In addition, every seafarer comes on board with a unique set of people in his network. There's a bit of overlap between the shipmates, to be sure, with people they have in common. But growing up in their own neighborhoods and families, each one had social ties that were unique to them, as we all do. Take these men who are sailing into harbor. If a crew of 50 docked at a new harbor, each one being hosted by a local person or family he hadn't yet met, all of their social networks would expand, both the crew and the town folk. At the moment when a mariner accepts hospitality from someone new, he's expanding his social network. When he gets back in the ship, his world is a little bigger. Perhaps on a future voyage, when he returns to his place, he looks for this new friend and meets his second degree connections. Now, Imagine this kind of dynamic change happening at every embarkation and disembarkation in all of these ports on a daily basis. The network of Greek people trading and visiting across the Mediterranean and Black Seas reinforced Greek values and customs and patterns among the Greek city-states, reproducing activities in a self-organizing way as a complex system. We imagine ships coming into all of these ports, bringing in raw materials and finished products, staples and luxuries, inventions and new ideas too. A ship has been called possibly the most complex piece of material culture of its time, laden with its cargo of commodities. It was also crammed with the nets, knives, cooking pots, crockery, gaming pieces, and navigational devices that sustained the crew and the passengers throughout the voyage, end quote. The things they carried on board became an assemblage within the context of the ship. But these thing-thing relationships were inherently unstable and dynamic as things were consumed taken off the ship or ruined and tossed overboard. Human thing interactions also changed in response to additions and subtractions to the assemblage of things on board. The scale of this activity and the interactions going on daily in all of those ports is incredible. As I mentioned before, the final deposit for an amphora of wine or olive oil could be the bottom of the sea. Ships were vulnerable to weather and pirates, and every voyage carried risks. A ship is safest in harbor, but that's not what ships are for. Making multiple voyages was exciting, possibly lucrative, but surely dangerous. Merchant ships sailed only from May to October. Nevertheless, many went down. Shipwrecks provide us with a wealth of information about the Mediterranean economy. Historians use statistics to estimate how many ships were sailing 
in any given century based on the number of shipwrecks that we know of. From that, we can guess at the robustness of the economy. This chart shows the number of Greek archaic and classical shipwrecks from about 600 to 300 BC, in, circled in red, jumping up when the Romans enter the scene. The most remarkable place in Greece today for underwater excavations has to be Forni, the Forni archipelago near the island of Samos, one of the Dodecanese islands. Western Samos is poor in good harbors and Ikaria too has few ports. The Narrows also made ships vulnerable to pirates because a ship's path was predictable in the area. But the Narrows mitigated conditions at sea, such as wind ships and waves, so they were often used. They call the area a, grave ship, a ship graveyard because so far in the last decade, the archeologists there have discovered 58 shipwrecks dating from the fifth century BC to the 19th century AD. Many are too deep to excavate, so mapping and documenting them is important. Ancient mariners were also well aware of the dangers. Their myths are full of stories of men tossed by the sea whom Poseidon tortured for 10 years like Odysseus, just trying to get himself and his men home after the Trojan War. In this comical portrayal of Odysseus, the Greek vase painter here uses two sideways amphoras, two fish, and some waves as code for a shipwreck. Boreas, the north wind, tortures Odysseus naked except for a trident and his cape billowing in the wind. At Forni, on one ship alone, excavators found amphoras from Cyprus, Egypt, Asia Minor, mainland Greece, Rome, Spain, and North Africa, as well as the closer in Aegean islands of Patmos and Samos. We will be learning so much about the ancient economy from their work. The heritage management of the area is also trying something very innovative, creating water parks for the areas where tourists could snorkel or dive to see these wrecks with a guide to develop tourism in a controlled way and give visitors an extraordinary experience. To read more about that, visit coreseal.com, that's spelled K-O-R, S-E-A-L dot com for your next vacation. Now moving to the Black Sea, the coast off of Bulgaria. In 2017, this 75 foot shipwreck was found lying whole with its mast, rudders, and even the rowing benches intact after more than 2,400 years. It is the oldest shipwreck of its type part of a, a ship graveyard of 60 ships from all periods. Because it is at the bottom of the Black Sea, which is anoxic, 1.3 miles down, Hello. it is preserved almost perfectly because no marine life Hi. can eat away. I'm in here. Space. I'm going to keep it's my um, camera off. I'm not in the most picturesque what was it story? Of places in our basement. I'll remind you of the pot <laughs> I asked you to I'm remember happy to the ship, ship on, uh, but Odysseus <laughs> strapped it to the mast. Yes. That is the nice ship. Nice to see you too. The physical remains of the hull of the ship on the seafloor signals to archaeologists that there mm -hmm. was mobility right, of so. materials and people. The making and use of this ship facilitated 70s. a network of people <laughs> who were connected to others yeah. living in the ancient Greek world. The amphoras on board were once on used in manufacturing, distributing, the, and consumption of commodities such as grains, olive oil, so and wine. Check out These people created, found, bought, <laughs> sold, or used mm -hmm. material things that were consumed, exchanged, and created in social contexts. 
the object itineraries of the cargoes carried by this ship come to a halt yes. here. When we read about shipwrecks or see photographs like those, I visualize the crew with their social networks now gone missing, missed terribly at home, and impoverishing the communities they used to visit by their absence. Sure, when the ship went down, the microeconomy took a hit in terms of the goods intended for sale that never made it. But a more significant economic impact is to look at the structural hole this ship leaves in the network. The work that won't be done on the ship, the loss of jobs for the people who repaired the ship, made the sails, provided the rope, took care of the mules and beasts of burden to carry the cargo on shore, the canoes on the rivers waiting for goods that will never come. This cultural analysis and model of Greek shipping and trade has been built on insights drawn from the theories of materiality, that is exploring the thingness of things, their life cycles and contexts, entanglement, seeing how things and humans are codependent, actor network theory, emphasizing the technological relationships which bring man-made things into the world, and the cultural traditions that perpetuate production of these things, social network analysis, through which we can map these ties and see clusters within the network, and finally, complexity theory, which lets us see these interdependencies as part of a self-organizing complex adaptive system. My contribution is to invent the field map, this kind of chart, where we see these things, humans, activities, and fields like economic and transportation all together. Each node on the sociogram has a small world inside it top left we see olive oil and the charts i showed you in the beginning would all have to be squeezed inside it the lines between them should be thought of like fiber optic cables transmitting packets of cultural traditions folk knowledge stories and more i developed the field map as a way of conceptualizing the entangled entities I could feel but not quite see. It turns out to provide a porthole through which to view the nested networks of entangled things and human activities that comprised seafaring in the archaic and classical periods. For the ancient Greeks, the realms of sea and land, of Poseidon and Zeus, were always in tension. Hades was always lurking underneath. The ancient Greek would have recognized that a nostos, reaching a homecoming, was a significant accomplishment. If one had been away a long time, much will have changed. At as everything is always in flux. For the young men who ventured far from their metropolis to make a new polis in greater Greece, nostalgia is the cost of the experience of living an adventurous life. The homecoming experience can be complicated for young and old alike. If an older man has had many sea voyages and over time has seen too many near wrecks or dangers. One last homecoming is all he yearns for. The peculiar ache which belonged to seafarers who hoped for a safe homecoming one more time is called a nostos algia, a nostalgia for a return. If one stays at home, one never needs to feel the pain of nostos idea. In the creation myths of the ancient Greeks, the domain of the sky belongs to Zeus, the land and the dark place below it to Hades, 
and the seas to Poseidon. The sky belongs to the immortal ones, but human life consists of the tension between sea and land, between feeling tethered or adrift, being on earth or water, staying home or venturing out, always calculating risks and rewards. Like us, ancient Greeks would have been born on land and with luck would eventually be laid to rest on land. But for them, the lived life their being in the world cycled between stretches of time at home to sit under their own vines and their olive trees with their families and the risky yet rewarding ventures in a boat at sea. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. That was excellent. I want to remind everybody that if you, uh, if you can, go to the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A, and please ask a question, and I will read that to uh, Diane. 